chapter 2 from verse 6 since God's servant has begun from there I was excited today that we're wearing the same color so I, I said I found this frequency so let me begin with the scripture he started with as well glory to God you can touch sound for me this is Paul speaking and he was trying to open our understanding to the heritage that we have in God and the magnitude of that which God has made available for those that love his name but he began to tell us that although God has done and secured so much for us but these things are hid it will take our desire and labor in the spirit of wisdom to excavate them and I'm starting from here particularly because I want you to know that everything God has made available for you, you must search to find them. Because if you don't find them, you can never experience them. He said the secret things belong to God. He said but the things that are revealed, he said they are revealed as an advantage to his children forever and ever. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 and so the blessings of the believer they are locked in the secrets of God and so you must pay the price to find them and you must also pay the price through alignment with the Holy Ghost to let them out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 5 he say you are the children of light and you know the light shines in the darkness the darkness comprehends it not so by default, we are offsprings of glory, power, and dominion. But in Matthew 5, 16, he said, let your light so shine. The undoing of many believers is the fact that they have not paid the price to secure the things that are hid for them. He said, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. They are my people. I don't deny them. So the people of God can be destroyed. God, where are you? God, why? It's a wrong question. The question you should ask is, how do I access what you have, you have made available? Because the Bible said, according as his divine power, Second Peter 1 verse 3, he has given us all things that pertains to life and godliness. He said, but it is through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So the scriptures here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 6 to 9 was Paul trying to carry us through a journey of revelation to show us the boundless possibilities that God has made available to us. And he said we speak wisdom among them that are mature, amongst them that are perfect. He said yet not the wisdom of this world nor of the princes of this world that come to know. In verse 7, he said, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. These things are coded. That is why when we say some of the things we say, the people of the world think we are fanatics. Fanatics of things that don't exist. But the thing is, they can't understand it. That's why they think we are fanatics. But a generation will rise that will not just understand this, but manifest it. Because the way we prove the things we say are not just esoteric realities that cannot be explained or manifested. It's when we begin to manifest them. So the goal of this conference is not just to give you information. It's to show you spiritual strategies to help you manifest excelling glories and dimensions in God. It's that the hidden wisdom of God which was ordained before the world began unto our glory. So there are things God has installed to make us live a life of glory. Nobody who is in God's government is expected to live a life that is below the frequency of glory. They were healed for our glory. In verse 8, he said, which none of the princes of this world knew. He said, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So these guys are in the archives of the spirit, trying to search the things God has made available. But every attempt they make to discover it results in a miscalculation. You are the one who think spirits don't labor. Many spirits are researchers. They are finding out, what, what, why does God love man? You know, there's a question in the spirit in Psalm 8 from verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him? 
the son of man that thou visitest him. Because from aeons, they know that Elohim as God was only worshipped. How come there's a new creature, the youngest creature in the block? Because we are actually the youngest in God's creation. <laughs> Can you imagine? Even the animals are older than us. <laughs> Everything was created before God created us. And they are wondering, well, what, is God, what is it about this last born that all of us are struggling to come to the throne room to worship God? Whereas God will leave the throne room and is looking for him in the garden. Adam, where are you? <laughs> it's an honor to access the throne room. But God now left the throne room and is looking for the man. Who is this? There is something packaged for your glory. Your job is to find it. And when you find it, your life becomes a wonder to your generation. In verse 9, Paul began to show us the excellency of what God made available. He said, but as it is written, he said, I had not seen, nor ear had, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. You can imagine the one that it was prepared, prepared for is the one that have not seen it. Is the one that has not heard it. Is the one whose heart has not conceived it. You who God prepared it for. This is why you must pay the price to search. Because if you don't find it, you can't manifest it. This is why this conference has been put together. To help us contemplate some of the things God has put in place. And to know how to walk in their reality. So that the glory of God on our lives will begin to find expression. But before I talk about the things God has put in place. Let me talk about two things to give us an idea of the magnitude of what Paul said, eyes have not seen. To give us an idea because God, first of all, is the embodiment of these realities. Because everything God gives us and everything we hope to have is first of all in God. Accessing things is not necessarily about making them come to being. Accessing things is actually about receiving what God has already made available. And all of these things are realities in God. So when we look at the things that God carries, then we'll go down to look at the ones the fathers have touched. At least it will provoke an appetite. Because I was sharing in Lagos last night, I told them, we have a heritage. We are coming from somewhere. What we are talking about here, there are men who have embodied certain dimensions. So when you touch those things, you will now understand that Christianity is not a religion. There is a heritage deeper than anything any religion of the world knows. Christianity is divinity expressed through humanity. And there are people who have hosted dimensions of God and presented to their generation. We are going to look at God first. Then we look at some of these people and the things they've touched. By the time I achieve that, then I will show you some of the things that God has already planted in you. So that you will know how to access those same things that are in God and those things that men of old have accessed. So that they can prepare you for what you need to access. Because there is something about the past that always explains the present. You can never have an accurate understanding of the present except as you begin to glean from the past. So very quickly, let's use 15 minutes to look at who God is. Because you can't understand these possibilities until you know the one who embodies it. And then we we'll use another 10 minutes to look at some of the patriarchs. Some of the things they handled in God. So that we will know what to trust. Because if you don't know these things, you might even be praying, you won't know what to expect. A point will come, you think prayer is how long you have prayed. Meanwhile, there are glories that you are supposed to enter and walk in. In Romans 15 verse 4, it said the things that were written aforetime, it said they were written for our learning. So that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So let's see what God embodies. There are three things that makes God, God. If you study your Bible, you will find it. Number one is deity. Number two is divinity. And number three is his offices. You know, there's a difference between deity and divinity. There are other entities in the realm that have attributes of divinity. But only God has attributes of deity. And that is why only God should be worshipped. 
because he's the one who has those attributes. The essential attributes of God are the things that makes him deity. But he also has moral attributes that he shares with his creation that makes his creation too to have elements of divinity. You know, Paul, Peter speaking in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4, he said, he has made us, he has given us exceeding great and precious promises that by this we might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through, through loss. So there are things of God that are in us that makes us divine because we are partakers of his divine nature. But we are not deity. That's why we can't be worshipped. Only God is deity. So when we look at who God is from the perspective of deity, divinity, and his offices, you will have a little understanding of the things that he can make available. Because when God blesses you, he doesn't bless you from your realm. He blesses you from his realm. My God shall supply all my needs according to, not according to my needs. Your need may be one million, but when God wants to supply, what he has is beyond one million. He may begin with one billion. So he's not blessing you based on who you are or what you can carry. He's blessing you based on who he is and what he can carry. Glory to God. That's why even at your level, a beggar might look at you and is looking for 100 naira to eat. But the least you have is 1,000. So you give him 1,000. You are not blessing him from his realm. You are blessing him from your realm. So if you want to know <laughs> the things God can give you, you need to understand his magnitude. And it will help your faith and help your mind. So when you approach him, he will know what to ask for. Because if you assume that he's like you, you may be asking him only for daily bread. When he's giving nations. You may be asking him for health. When he's giving, the, he's giving what is superior to health. He's giving divine life that makes you live above sickness. You may be asking him for favor with men. When he's sending you into your world as the symbol of what favor means. But the thing is because you don't know him that you have approached. So let's take time to study God from his deity, which are his essential attributes, to his divinity, which are his moral attributes, and then to his offices, which are the places where he occupies. So what are the essential attributes of God that only God has? There are seven of them. Number one, God is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. So when you approach this being, your history is not a factor. The challenge you are facing, your forefathers may have faced it, is not a limitation to God. He is older than them. The problem you are going through may have existed for 1,000 years. Age is not a factor in his realm. The Bible call him the, calls him the ancient of days. And so there is nothing happening to you now that is not older than. So he has cure for it. He is eternal. He has no beginning and he has no end. In 1 Timothy 1.17, the Bible calls him the king eternal, immortal, invincible. Because of this, he calls him the only wise God. The only wise God to whom belongs honor and glory. So you must first of all understand that the one you are approaching, even time is inside him. So there is no such thing as you came late or God came late. The equation of time is removed in his realm. When God shows up, that is the right time. There is no past or future with him. He is in eternal now because himself is eternity. That's the first attribute of God. Every other thing began after God and inside God. Only God has no beginning. Only God has no end. So there is nothing that is too difficult for him to handle because he knows the origin of all things. Number two, God is self-existent. And what that means is that God exists in and from himself. He doesn't exist in things 
He can put his reality in things, but he exists in and from himself. You and I exist in God. Glory to God. And so outside God, we have no existence. But outside us, God is. So he doesn't need anything to be God, but everything needs him to be what they are. So God exists in and from himself. And that's not all. He also exists for himself. God is the purpose of God. You have a purpose in God. And if you don't fulfill it, your existence is a waste. But God is his own purpose. That means he's not living for anything or for anybody. This is why when you approach God, you approach him with confidence. Because he doesn't need anybody's permission to bless you. If they are happy, that's their business. If they are angry, that's their business. He doesn't exist for anybody. As you are here now, even if there's no human being on earth that makes you careful while you take your action, God will make you to be careful while you take action because you live for God. But when God is taking action, he's not careful about anything. He is living for himself. That's why when God chooses you that he will bless you, nobody can stop it. The anger of anybody is inconsequential. When Samuel came to the house of, 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 of to, to the house of uh, Samuel now, came to the house of, what's his name again? Jesse, to bless his children. Jesse chose seven that he felt were qualified and left David. Samuel looked at all of them, wanted to bless Eliab. God said, I have refused him. I have not rejected him. There's a difference between rejection and refusal. I have refused him. And there was no apology. When he checked all of them, no one was choosing. He checked again, no one was choosing. He now said, is there no other person? They said, well, there's one boy in the forest. He's not, he has not baited though. He has been with the animals for 14 days. He will be smelling now. He said, nobody will eat here until that boy comes. And when David come, he said, this is my anointed. He didn't go to Eliab and say, sorry, you know, uh, I, I, it's because of, no, there's no explanation. He's self-existent. I've chosen David, my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. So if you know what is good for you, align with him. He's the choosing one. I'm telling you this so that anything God tells you, you will do it with audacity. Anything anybody thinks is not a factor. He's the self-existent one that has ordained you. And that's not all. God is immutable. Malachi 3 verse 6. I am the Lord. I change not. I mean, self-existent is Exodus 3.14. I am that I am, have sent you. Then he's immutable. Malachi 3 verse 6. I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, ye the sons of Jacob are not consumed. You know what that means? It means God does not change. And it also means God cannot change. So when God tells you he will bless you, he won't change his mind. And nobody can change his mind. Nothing can convince him otherwise. So you can bank on God any day, any time. Your circumstance is not potent enough to alter what God has said. If he said it, he will do it. So you can depend on what he says with your life. He is immutable. See, I'm laying a foundation because I want to say some things that are difficult to believe. When we talk about endless possibilities, you need to know where our faith anchors up. So that when we are saying some things, it will become hard for you to doubt. Because of the one who said it and the one upon whom your faith is built. God is immutable. I am the Lord. I change not. Because I don't change, you can bank on me. That is why Israel is preserved. And do you know that although we are new creations now, God is still working with Israel as a nation. <laughs> Jesus has come. Both the Israel and the Gentile have become one man in Christ. But because of what he told them, he's still protecting them. Nations rise up against them, they conquer. And you don't know how, but they prevail. The other time, the prime minister was speaking and he said, we are the eternal people. We don't finish. If you like, bring all the bombs in the world. We will remain here. Everybody can go. We will remain. And when you ask them how, they will go and open Exodus. 
this is one God. <laughs> he is immutable. They are in a land that is one of the worst lands you can imagine. But go and see their watermelon. It's four times the one you plant here. There's a technology that makes them to survive in the harshest of places. Because God told them this land flows with milk and honey. Agriculturally speaking, it doesn't look like it. But divinely speaking, it is so. And God has not changed his mind. Glory to God. Number four. He is omnipotent. And omnipotent means there is nothing impossible with God. He can tell you something that does not exist. It doesn't mean it won't happen. There is nothing. He has all power to do everything that he desires. So if God speaks, if it was not existing, it will start existing. If God speaks, even if the whole world were to be against you, it will still happen. This is why for some of us, it doesn't matter the number of our enemies. So long as God is on our side and we are on God's side, we will prevail. The more the opposition, the greater the glory. Because he is omnipotent. If he said it, he can do it. I can promise you something today. And something may happen to me overnight. I won't be able to do it again because I'm incapacitated. Not God. God cannot be incapacitated. He has all power to do all things that is according to his will. And that's not all. He also has the power to put his power under control. That's why absolute power cannot corrupt God. So omnipotence is power to do all things and power to be righteous in power. So God is faithful and kind, merciful and faithful, even in his power. It's called omnipotence. I'm showing you the reason why we dare to believe endless possibilities. Revelations 19 verse 6 And I heard as it were The voice of a great multitude And as the voice of many waters And as the voice of mighty thundering Saying hallelujah For the Lord God omnipotent Reigneth So reigning is a function of power And God is the Source of all power It is in this context that he both Creates and saves Only him has the power to do that Omnipotent that's not all. God is omniscient. That means he knows everything at every time, in every time, in every place. He knows everything at every time, in every time, in every place. Let me explain what that means. God knows everything happening everywhere in every universe now. Every part of the world every circumstance, every universe. God knows what is happening now. And God does not just know what is happening now. He knows everything that has happened since the first day something was created. And he already knows everything that will happen till the last day anything will exist. So he knows everything everywhere now and he knows everything in every time. So he knows everything yesterday he knows everything last year. He knows everything last 10 years and all the time that has been. And he already knows everything for the next 20 years. That's why when you come before God, you are confident. That means even the prayer you want to pray, he knows. That means the outcome, all the possible outcome, he already knows. But he chose to bless you. He chose to lift you. He chose to use you. So when you approach God, there's no need cutting corner. Just come and be truthful. Trusting in his mercy because he knows the ones you said and the ones you didn't say. And sometimes the ones you didn't say is more. And I say he knows everything in every place. He knows everything inside him and he knows everything outside him. As you are now, you think you know so much. You don't know your kidney. You have not seen inside your ear before. This one has been with you since you were born, but you have not seen it. <laughs> but God knows everything, everywhere, both inside and outside him. That's the level of knowledge. 
and at every time and in every time. And that's not all. Psalm 147 verse 5. Great is our Lord and great and of great power. His understanding is infinite. First Samuel 2 verse 3. Our God is a God of knowledge. By him actions are weighed. He knows all things. He has infinite understanding. And that's not all. He is omnipresent. Omnipresent means God is everywhere and God is in every time. As we are talking, everywhere in the world and every circumstance, the presence of God is there. He may choose to manifest it where he is glorified, but his presence is everywhere currently in the world. And that's not all. Everything in the world is in today, but God is still in yesterday. So God is not only in today. God is still in yesterday. God is still in last week. God is still in last year. Because if God lives yesterday like you and I, the cycle of existence will collapse. The world can't hold. So why you left yesterday into today, God remained there and God is already here. And you are hoping to enter tomorrow, God is already in tomorrow, waiting for you to meet him. That's why he's called Alpha Omega, the beginning and end. So he left you in yesterday, he's in today and he's waiting for you in tomorrow already. So when you are in God's hands, you are secured. See, men don't know this. That's why a governor can promise you something. You are so excited you can't sleep. Meanwhile, that governor, anything can happen overnight. Even if it's governor. And even if nothing happens, he will be there for four years. Max, eight years. You have 60, 80, 90 years to live. So the one who is in 1,000 years from now is the one to trust. He can use the governor to bless you. Don't despise men. But your trust must be in God, not in men. He said, woe unto him that puts his trust in the arm of flesh. And the reason we trust men, not God, is because we don't know who God is. We think we know, but we don't. He said, you are ingrained in the palm of his hand. Your yesterday, your today and tomorrow is there. He is already waiting for you. God is the only one who will tell you, you will go to Lagos safely. And then, he is already in Lagos waiting for you. And all through the journey, he is with you. So he will follow you through the journey and he's at the destination waiting for you. So it's not a talk. Everything he says is there. This is what the psalmist knew. And he said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he said, even in death, I fear no evil. Why? He said, for thou art with me. And if God is with you, it's enough. Omnipresent. If you don't know this, even if you pray, you'll be afraid. Because you think God is far somewhere and you are calling, hoping he will answer. Your God is not far. He's inside you. And he was in that circumstance before you came. Because he knew that circumstance will happen. Even in that circumstance, God is there. If you will discern him, he can change it immediately. He is omnipresent. This is the God that we serve. Acts chapter 17 verse 28 For in him we live In him we move And in him we have Our being There is no creature And there is no being On earth And in the whole universes of God That is eternal Self-existent Immutable, omnipotent Omnipresent and omniscient Only God is And that's why only him is God and that is what makes him deity every other being they call deity they call them deity because they don't have understanding that's why I said I am the Lord there is none beside me because men in their ignorance may call other spirits deity there is no spirit that has these attributes only God possesses them this is what makes him deity the one who qualifies to be worshipped then he has moral attributes. Moral attributes are the things that makes him divine. And those are the ones he shares with his creation. Like I showed you from 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4. When he said we are partakers of his divine nature. So when we say we are like God. We are saying we are like God in his moral attributes. Not in his essential attributes. If we become like God in his essential attributes. We will become deity. But we are not. 
but we are like God in his moral attributes because he shares them with us. And these moral attributes make us stand out amongst all the creation in the visible realm. I give you four of them very quickly because we are trying to have an understanding. Number one, perfect holiness. God is perfectly holy. And what does that mean? He is completely separate and incorruptible. It's a sinless state of existence. Separated and incorruptible. You can't corrupt God with evil. He is perfectly holy. In fact, the beauty of God comes from his holiness. So when you study holiness in its origin, you will discover that it expresses beauty. It's a state of absolute consecration where nothing external has the capacity to defy. That's who God is. He exists in his own class, separated unto himself. Revelation 15, 4. The Bible said, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. So any being that has tendency of holiness is because God shared with him. And even at that, we have not been able to attain perfection in holiness. Only God sits there. And so when God speaks, you need to know that he is talking from a realm where no creation is. If you make the mistake of comparing God with anything, you have set yourself up. And that's the problem of many believers. They don't know that he's perfectly holy. So when they read the word of God and God says, you are the head and not the tail. They are comparing it with what the government is saying to them. Because they don't know that God is holy. Where he talks from, no one dwells there. So when God talks to you, it is done. If you know that is the holy one talking. If you don't know these things as the foundation of your existence, you can never be mighty with God. Go and ask most of the men doing great things. Most of them, when God spoke to them, they didn't look like it. But they knew that the one talking is not a president. The one talking is not one of the kings of the earth. They knew the one talking is the holy one. And his words are distinct from every other person. God himself was talking. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away. Not one jot or tittle of my word will fail. He is the holy one that spoke. My word is different from every other. Number two. He is... He, he is perfectly righteous. That means he's absolutely right at all times. Now, this is God's mark of distinction in glory. His righteousness. And his righteousness is not just sinlessness. His righteousness is a state of power that makes it impossible for him to err. So, when God looks at you, you think you are dark. And they say, fair man. When you check yourself, you'll discover you are fair. And you didn't just become fair. You will discover you have always been fair. You and everybody saw you wrong. That's the power. So the power does not make you fair. It can change time and recalibrate your existence immediately. That's, the, that's, what I that's why the Bible said in Romans 5.17 It said they will receive abundance of grace And of the gift of righteousness It didn't say they shall just live above sin Yes when you are righteous You have the power to live above sin 1 John 3.7 My little children let no man deceive you He said him that is righteous Him that doeth righteousness is righteous So a righteous man should live above sin Because righteousness is power over everything around you so you should rule above sin but it's beyond that righteousness makes you a king you reign